Good morning. About three years ago, to almost the day, uh, this church set out on a journey of discernment that led us out of a former denomination into our current denomination called the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. <clears throat> that journey concluded this weekend as uh, all five of the pastors were suffering for the Lord down in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where we, uh, I, I had the chance to be uh, interviewed on the floor of Presbytery and examined and welcomed as a full member of the EPC and our new Presbytery of the West uh, in October, but this time the other four pastors were examined, and, and it, it's a pretty intimidating kind of deal. You preach a short message and answer a few questions, and then the floor opens up, and they can ask you anything they want. And I want to tell you, all four of our pastors just did an amazing job. Probably the highlight, though. I love it. Okay. Yeah. I'll just share one highlight. The one highlight was, you know, Pastor Bob's up there, the Bob father, and, and uh, he's done his thing, and, and it's time for, for people to be able to ask questions. And this young guy, you know, from, from a church... A uh, kind of recent seminary graduate comes up and he's got this complex question about the Westminster Confessions and the Second Commandment and, you know, images of God. And what does he think that means in terms of drama in the church? Pastor Bob sits there and goes, Well, you know, David danced naked in front of the temple and, you know, and I guarantee you that was the only time that was ever mentioned in any Presbyterian meeting. And, and, and that was just enough to get him out of the question. But anyways, I, it was really one of the great moments that I'll always remember, Pastor Bob talking about that. But our pastors did a great job. Uh, we are hard at it in, in really one of the, is this an intense time in the gospel? Has there been a non-intense time? I don't think so. But right here in Luke 12, Jesus is getting very intentional about teaching his disciples. And we've heard him give some pretty specific behavioral instruction about what sets his disciples apart from kind of the rest of the world. And he said things like, don't be a hypocrite like the Pharisees. Don't, don't be greedy. You know, be on, guard, be on your guard against all kinds of greed like this man who tore down his barns to build bigger ones. And don't worry. Do not worry. Do not chase after the things of this world like the pagans do. He's always differentiating his followers you know, from everybody else. And, and, and the behavior is, uh, is, in a positive sense, you know, to be set apart as those who are truthful, generous, and courageous, always trusting God to supply their needs. And today, our lesson will kind of build upon this theme. I've tackled a huge amount of scripture, and so we're going to stand and read Luke 12, 35, all the way through verse 48, and uh, let's dig in. Let's read this together. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces 
and assign him a place with the unbelievers. That servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Please be seated. Lord, we just, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's very direct and at times even more direct than we care for it to be, that, that you would tell us how this works, that you're the master and we're the servants. And, and I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit now to come and be in our midst in such a way that we'll have a clue what it is that you're saying. These are hard things for us to hear. And I know by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will absolutely bring conviction into the hearts and minds of those who are humble and ready to receive your wisdom as to what this means and what it claims upon our lives. Lord, I just pray that we will be ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before I launch into uh, this text for this morning, I'm a little bit concerned, and I want to make sure we guard our, ourselves against going down a path we don't need to go down, all right? Whenever we get into a passage or a, a long series of passages like we've seen here in Luke 12, where Jesus is getting very specific to his disciples, he says, don't be a hypocrite, don't be greedy, don't worry, be ready. It's easy for us to hear that as though somehow this is the behavioral expectation, the moral achievement that must be accomplished in order for us to be saved or in order for us to you know, be considered a Christian and a follower of Christ. And, and that is not at all what Jesus says. Jesus constantly calls you know, the most unexpected people to follow him, people who are buried in their sin, people who are buried in their shame, people who uh, you know, are, are the, the not superstars. I mean, he's constantly calling average Joes like you and me to follow him, and there's not some prerequisite morality or achievement that has to be obtained in order for you to become a follower of Christ. And I want to guard against that, because when you hear some of these behavioral imperatives, sometimes it's easy for us to misinterpret that as a standard by which, if we don't reach it, uh, we're, we're not welcome to follow Jesus, and, or you know, even to come to his church. That's not the case. The only thing that Jesus regularly says to those who would follow him is repent. Repentance is definitely something that, that precedes uh, receiving his grace and becoming a follower of Christ. But once we have been saved, once we have repented and been saved and, and brought in and adopted into the body of Christ, there is an expectation that our behavior will reflect our new identity. It is the sense that we have been brought in as citizens of the kingdom of God and, and now we are subject to our king. We're accountable to the king and we reflect that we are members of his kingdom with our behavior. It is the epitome of hypocrisy to claim that we follow Christ, that we wear you know, his armor and carry his shield and we, we say we're a member of the kingdom of God, but then we go about behaving like greedy pagans or self-righteous hypocrites. Jesus says, stop that. That's not, it's not even conceivable that, that we're gonna continue you know, unapologetically to live that way. If we've been called and adopted into God's children, we're going to behave in a way that reflects our identity. Today, he's going to say, and part of that, part of being a follower of Christ, you will be in a perpetual state of readiness. So let's take a look at that in verse 35. Jesus states, be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Now, you have to understand something. When we think of servants, we think of slaves, we think of you know, Africans being put on ships against their will, carried across the sea, and sold on a block, which is terrible, right? But that's not so much the picture within the ancient world. We have to understand that this relationship of master to servant was a very, very common relationship, and not just between the very wealthy and armies of servants that work for him. 
If, if you had any modest wealth within the ancient world, it was very likely that you had a servant of some kind. There's always somebody who was poorer than you who needed the work. And particularly if you had any, any reality of a home, it would be very likely that you would have servants that lived as part of your home. Uh, when we go to Africa, we still see this with our partners who are by no means wealthy. But even those who have any moderate degree of wealth or even have a home of any kind, it's very common, it's almost expected that they will also have essentially servants who live in their home. Uh, for example, Peter Maseko, uh, the, the doctor, pastor who we partner with in Malawi, when we go to stay at his home, he has a man who's part of his household who is his night watchman, which is a wise thing to do there, right? They also have a live-in servant, if you will, who helps with the cooking and the cleaning. Now, it's a master-to-servant relationship. I don't know if Peter would ever call himself a master, but it's also kind of a familial relationship. It's, it's part of the household, and that really is the picture that I want you to have in your mind. This was so common within the ancient world that Jesus easily refers to this kind of a relationship that everyone knew and understood um, you know, in, in, in his teaching as a parable to help demonstrate what it is like for us to live in a relationship to Christ. And the first thing he states is that we should have our loins girded about. I mean, that would be the literal translation. But the NIV has given us a less graphic and, and generally correct translation by saying, be dressed and ready for service. Why? Well, because it, as you know, in the ancient world, people wore robes, oftentimes still in the Middle East, they wear robes today. But the robes oftentimes would just kind of ride a, a few inches above uh, the ground. And if you're a servant, you, and you're ready to go to work, you would pull those up and wrap them around and shove them in your belt so that you know, you're not tripping over yourself when you're carrying things, you're doing the tasks necessary uh, to accomplish your job. So for a servant to be walking around his master's house with the robes hanging down, would be to indicate that he's off duty, <laughs> that, that he's, he's, not, he's not available to serve the master. And Jesus says, be dressed for service. Keep, keep, keep them wound up and tucked in and ready to roll. You, you, there's no such thing as being off duty. The Lord may come and call at any moment, be ready so as not to trip over yourself. Now I wonder if we actually took that seriously in our own lives and started thinking about the fact that when we got up in the morning, that we were wrapping it up and tucking it in and getting ready to go to work for our master. That, that our whole existence, the reason we had a bed and we had food and th that we had any existence within you know, the kingdom was that we were servants. In every moment of our day, we were to be ready to, to serve him and, and jump into action. I mean, I wonder how many of us as Americans in our kind of hyper-individualism and that me, me, me kind of world, how many of us would feel a little resentment toward this picture. Like, what about me? What about my needs? What about my agenda? I mean, surely Jesus isn't saying that our whole lives, every minute of every day, is to be lived in servitude to God. And I would say, yeah, that's basically what he's saying. And he's not really apologizing for it. As Christ followers, we've been forgiven, set free, and adopted. We've been welcomed as subjects of God's kingdom, but we are subject to the king. And, and this is how he's describing this. You're subject to the king. Be ready. All the time, be ready. Your time is not your own. It belongs to the master. Next, he states, keep your lamps burning. What does that mean? All right, well, if you're, you know, you have to go live someplace where they have no electricity, right? Because as soon as it gets dark, even hints to get dark, in an environment where there's no electricity, they light their lamps. You don't wait till it gets dark because then you wouldn't be able to find your lamp, right? And this, everyone knows this illustration uh, of lighting a lamp. And of course, the servants would light their lamps to perform whatever tasks are necessary to prepare for the next day. But when they're done, they would blow the lamp out. And the minute you blow that lamp out, you're just there. You're wherever you are. When that lamp goes out, you're just going to be right there until the next day. It means that it's quitting time. Jesus says, keep them lit. There's no such thing as quitting time. There's no such thing as seeking your own rest when the master is not resting. As long as the master is yet to return, the servants are to be dressed for action with their lamps lit. Why? Because that's who you are. 
your servants. You exist to serve the needs and the desires and the agenda of the master. That's, that's why you're here. That's why you have a home. That's why you have clothes and food and, and a small income. Everything that you enjoy belongs to the master, but ultimately, you're there to serve him, not yourself. Jesus says, his followers, his disciples, should be like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose, masters, whose master finds them watching when he comes. Now, a wedding banquet, even for pastors today, seems like it goes a long time, right? But in the ancient world, it would go for at least you know, four or five days. is not a whole week. It's still common in many parts of the world for wedding banquets to go that long. So if you're a servant or you're working with the servants of the master's household, you have no idea when he's going to come back. He might come back in a day. He might come back in two days. It might be six or seven days. You don't know. But they have their responsibilities, and they know they need to be ready for the master to come back. Now, in the daylight hours, that's pretty easy. You know, you're just going about your task, and if you, if you see him down the road, you open the gate, and, and, and there he is. But the picture here is that he's likely to come at night. Why? Well, in the Middle East, people traveled at night all the time to avoid the oppressive heat. And so you're going to have to keep your lamps lit. And taking the night shift is going to be difficult, right? Because the long labor of the day begins to wear on you, and it gets cold, and, and you just want to call it a night. You want to blow out the light and just go to bed. And if you do that, if you're the lazy servant, or you're the, the, the servant that really doesn't care about the master all that much, then you'll blow that light out with the hope that the master doesn't come back until tomorrow, right? You're actually hoping he doesn't come back. And I say the unloving or the uncaring servant would, would act in that way because the caring servant, the one who loves his master, will burn the midnight oil night after night after night waiting for the master to return. Why? Because within this parable, within the context of, of the story, there's danger that awaits if that master comes back in the middle of the night and there's no one there to open the gate. The gate opens from the inside. What happens? Well, he might have to dismount. He has to just sit there and wait. And at that moment, he could be robbed. He could be attacked by wild animals. I mean, the sense of we're waiting all night in case the master comes back is an indication of the love of the servant for the master. And Jesus says, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Now, that could have been the end of the story, and it would have been a pretty good story. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone knew that servants belonged to the master, that they, their life was not their own. I mean, that wasn't anything new. And, and it says it would be good for those servants when the master returns from the wedding banquet, and they're awake, and they have the lamps lit, and they open the gates. I mean, it'll be good for them, which means what? Well, maybe they get a little bonus, or unlike the lazy servants, they don't get punishment. But that's not where the story stops. What comes next was never even thought of. It wasn't even a concept until these words came out of Jesus' mouth. Listen to what he says. I tell you the truth, the master will dress himself to serve, will have them, those attentive servants who burn the midnight oil, he will have them recline at the table and the master will come and wait on them. He says it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the second or third watch in the middle of the night, right? Now, Dr. Kim Bailey, you know, I quote him all the time. I love this guy. I lived in the Middle East for 20 years. He says, listen, the traditional role of master and servant are well-defined in the Middle East. For a master to serve his own servants is unheard of. That's not just then. It's even now within the Middle Eastern culture. But Jesus makes it clear that for these faithful servants who burn the midnight oil night after night who are, who, who are ready and waiting to serve, that when the master comes, not only will they be rewarded, he will actually take on the form of a servant and he will serve them. Now, we're used to this day, you know, if you're a leader, you read leadership books or whatever, I mean, you're used to this concept of a servant leader. In fact, almost all the great leadership books now talk about leaders who are people who have a clear passion and vision and they are servant leaders. That concept did not exist before Jesus Christ, and it came out of this passage right here. And then, obviously, the full expression of that that we see later when Jesus actually, 
you know, washes the feet of his disciples. But the question is, why? Why would the master put on servant clothes and wait upon the servants? I think it's because the master knows that the servants who have faithfully maintained vigil throughout the night, night after night, awaiting his return, these are the servants who did their service out of love for the master. It was not fear or mechanical duty that kept them on that wall. These servants were motivated by a deep love for the master. Now, why would the servants, servants, why would they have such a deep love for the master? Now, here comes the gospel. Because the master first loved them. And this is always at the heart of the gospel. This sense that we serve, that we're servants to a master, is always positioned in a way for us to understand it, that we serve out of love because he first loved us. I mean, you have to understand, you know, within the gospel context, even when this, this parable, the only thing we can assume is that this master purchased these servants away from a tyrant. They were slaves to a tyrant. And he pays the price to purchase them, bring them into his own house. He does give them roles to play. He feeds them. He clothes them. He provides them a safe place. But they serve him. And he's a just and honorable master. And these servants then, who recognize what they've been delivered from, what they were purchased from, they stay on that wall night after night. They're ready for service. They have their lamps lit. They await for the master's return. And these servants will understand not only the love of the master from being delivered, but then the master will take the form of a servant and love them and serve them. It is this powerful picture of reciprocal love back and forth that's initiated by the master and responded to by the servant. And once again, the love of the master overwhelms them. Uh, this is a perfect example of why when we read the Bible, we must resist thinking of Jesus Christ as this great and awful taskmaster, the scorekeeper who's looking for reasons to punish those who displease him. That is the furthest thing from the truth. Christian service, as presented in the parable, is motivated and fueled by the deep mutual love between the master and those who serve the master. I don't know, I, I, I shouldn't even mention this, probably some of you be offended, but I mean, I'm a guy. I love the movie Gladiator. It just is what it is. I'm sorry. I just, I don't like all the gore, but it's a powerful historic representation of a time in our history. And I think Russell Crowe does a great job of playing, you know, General Maximus Decimus Meridius. I just think he's awesome in that movie. And one of the early scenes in that movie, General Maximus is obviously over the entire Roman army, the greatest war machine the world has ever known prior to the Germans. But he, he clearly is about to go to war. He's got all of his troops lined up. They're going against this barbaric group of you know, crazy-looking people. But as he moves amongst his men, the movie helps you to understand that these men love their general. They don't serve him just because he has positional authority. They serve him. They're willing to die for him. They'll go to war with him because they love him. And why do they love this man? You find out as the movie goes on that they love their general because he's not just over them, he's also one of them. And this is the picture of the gospel constantly. Jesus absolutely is the Lord. He's the general. He has all positional authority over us as the son of God. He demands our allegiance. He has every right to demand our service and even our lives. But his call to follow him and to serve him is not one of coercion or threat. And I just, I, I keep coming back to that because I think it's very easy to read the scripture and feel coercion or threat. That is not the picture in the New Testament at all. His call to follow is one of love and passion. And we know that the disciples who followed him, they weren't threatened to follow him. They left everything out of a love and adoration and a loyalty to this man. Why? Because he's not only over us, he's also one of us. He is our general, the one who first takes on our lowly uniform, takes on our low station, goes to battle against our ancient enemy, sacrifices his very life, and then on, upon his victory over death, sets the prisoners free. He is not only over us, he is one of us. We don't follow him in the battle. We don't carry his shield and raise our sword out of mechanical duty 
or a sense of coercion or even this fear or even this sense of maybe if we do this, we get his stuff. We follow the general because he first loved us. And it, that, that is always the picture of faithful discipleship in the scriptures. Unfortunately, this following is going to be tested. And one of the most profound ways it's going to be tested is when we are called to wait. Let me just take a quick straw poll. How many of you love to wait? Like you just can't wait to wait for something. Thank you, because I would ask you to leave. If you, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I hate to wait. I mean, how many of you are the people like, you'll drive three extra miles to avoid a single stoplight? Yeah, come on now, come on now. That's right. All right, that's me. I don't like to wait for anything. And waiting really is a necessity of life. It's a great skill. And constantly the Bible talks about waiting upon the Lord. But this is one of the great tests. And Jesus knows this. He knows that if we can get around this being ready and waiting thing, we will do it. Like if we could predict exactly when Jesus was going to come back, we'd just kind of live it up and then at the last five minutes say, I'm really, really sorry, please do that. You know, and, and he says, almost in tongue in cheek, he says, now understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. I mean, other places in the scripture, it says he will literally come like a thief in the night. There's no way that we can, in some way, sit back and say, well, I'll worry about that later. I'll be accountable to God later. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's just not gonna happen today, so let's just live it up and, and don't worry about it. He says, you have no idea. He will come at an hour when you do not expect him. God moves on his own agenda. The Son of Man will return when he's ready, and it may be soon, it may be not. But regardless of when the master returns, the faithful servant, the loving servant, is dressed and ready with his lamps lit. Now that's easy enough for a while, but it gets harder over time, doesn't it? That's why sometimes we have this initial conversion experience. We're so excited. We're ready to head out on the mission field or whatever. But time beats away at our faith. Why? Because we're having to wait. And in this waiting period, things are not always as they should be. I mean, we're, we're, we're struggling, aren't we? And our, our faith is tested and refined in the waiting. But there's something else that's happening while we're waiting, and that is that we're, we're discovering that we don't wait in isolation. That there's other people who are not waiting. There's other people who serve a different master, and their master invites them into all kinds of devilish fun. And before long, these other people around us who are not waiting, who are serving other masters, they begin to scorn us a little bit, don't they? They may say things to us. They may question why we're burning the midnight oil, subjecting ourselves to discipline, and denying our own comfort to honor and wait for a master that cannot be seen. Everyone knows when the master is away, it's time to play. Come on, dude, lighten up. Why so vigilant? Why so serious? Why so devoted? Eat, drink, and be merry. Do what's best for you. Do what feels good for you. If it feels good, do it. I mean, look around. Do you really think that your master is all that great when our masters invite us to just indulge in all the sinful little toys and pleasures we want? I mean, surely he's not coming back tonight. Have, a, have another one, right? Why don't you take a break? I'm sure this master of yours knows that you need to take care of yourself and have some fun. I mean, who does this master guy think he is anyways? You don't need a master. Be your own master. This is constantly, unrelentingly, un un unrelentlessly just coming at us, isn't it? It's just coming at us all the time. And it will be what tests us to discern whether we are those who truly love our master or we just love hanging out at his house. We either love the master or we're just trying to do enough to make sure that we get his stuff. If we don't truly love the master because we're not really convinced of what it was that we were rescued from, you see, here's what will happen is we'll start taking breaks from our vigilance. We'll stop waiting for a short period and it'll be a little bit longer period. Before long, the only time we're really waiting on the Lord is about an hour on Sunday. And we'll begin to occupy our time by dabbling with the master's stuff while he's away. And if we dabble with it long enough, 
we'll forget that it belongs to him and we'll start assuming it belongs to us. And if we, belong, you know, if we dabble with the master stuff that we're convinced belongs to us long enough, you see, not only will we not be looking for the master to come back, we'll kind of be hoping he doesn't come back. And if we hope that he doesn't come back long enough because we're so, you know, comfortable dabbling with all of his stuff, then eventually we'll begin to believe the lie that there was never actually a master in the first place. That all the stuff that we enjoy, it just kind of came out of no place, time and chance. Or if there is a master, he's not that fierce kind of awesome general guy who gave up his whole life to defeat the enemy and rescue us and bring us into his house. It's more like this doting old fool who just won't really care what we do while he's away. Listen, <laughs> you know, either Jesus is the master and he's coming again and we are accountable as his servants or this whole thing's just a lie. It's one of those two things, right? And quite frankly, for an awful lot of us, we're thinking, I don't really care. I mean, I may care someday, but I don't care right now. Until you have a brush with life and death, until it suddenly dawns upon you that you actually do believe that you go on. You know, like 90% of Americans believe that they're heaven and they're going to it. At some point, you're going to say, no, but I believe that I go on. How is that? Well, somebody must be responsible for that. And that somebody is likely going to hold us accountable for what we did on this side. And then we think to ourselves, you know, as much as it sounds great to just be able to live it up and do whatever we want, kind of be this hedonistic person who just like, you know, just parties all the time, have those people ever been the noble figures in history? Have we ever admired those people? No. Who are the people who have changed the world? They're people who had this sense <clears throat> that they served a higher calling, that they served a master, and they were willing to give their lives for it. It doesn't take much for us to understand that life is just not about just meeting our own needs. Jesus says clearly right here in Luke 12, I, I am the master. You're the servant. And I'm coming back. And you need to be ready. You need to be watching. If we love him, we'll wait. And if we don't, then we're just hanging out at his house playing with the stuff, hoping he doesn't come back. This gets pretty intense, and I think Peter feels the intensity of what he just said. <clears throat> Verse 42, he says, Lord, uh, question, uh, are you telling this parable to us or like to everyone? Don't you love Peter? He always asks the question we're all thinking, right? I mean, aren't we all thinking that? Like, I don't really know, like, is this me? I mean, is this parable for me? Is this, or like for all those other people? And I don't know what response Peter expected, but I suspect it wasn't the one that he got. Jesus replies, <clears throat> uh, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? He's just introduced a new level of servant, hasn't he? They were just servants, but now there's the manager of the servants, the one who's entrusted by the master to make sure that the servants are fed in the household. He says, who's that? Clearly, he's looking right at Peter. He's looking right at the 12. He's looking right through history at any person that he puts in a position of feeding his flock, of being a leader of his house. And he says, I tell you, it will be good for this guy, this manager, if he is doing what he's supposed to, providing nourishment for the other servants when the master returns. I tell you the truth, the master will put this faithful servant in charge of all his possessions. I mean, this is common. Jesus says, he who's faithful with a little will be entrusted with much, right? But now, here comes the, right? But he who has been entrusted with this authority or this responsibility or, or this, this investment of the master will be held accountable. And should the master return, and find that the manager, the one who is put in leadership over the servants, over his house, has grown weary of waiting. And as a result of his unwillingness to wait, he becomes abusive and wreaks violence upon the body, upon the house, upon the other servants, beats them, and then he, he indulges himself 
With that which was supposed to go to the servants, he makes himself fat and happy and gets drunk. He says, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour that he's not aware of, he will cut him in half and assign him a place with the unbelievers. I mean, this is a really intense picture. And you can't help but, I think it's reasonable to assume that this picture is intended to apply to those who's been entrusted by Christ to lead the church. People like Peter and the 12, these servants are believers, it's, the, it's his house, and this manager has been entrusted to, to feed and care for these servants. To, and this appointment is significant. Because all the, the servants in the master's house are dependent upon this manager doing his job. If the entrusted leader is faithful, he receives a greater charge. But if he's not, if he's self-serving, if he wreaks violence upon the servants of the Lord, then the penalty is dichotomeo, which is the root of our word dichotomy. It is literally to be cut in half. And the punishment then extends beyond the suffering. This person, this soul, will also be cast into exile. He will no longer be part of the master's house. He'll be outside, be assigned a place with the unbelievers. I mean, this is exactly the language that's always used to describe hell. This is a very serious moment in the teaching of Christ. Note that the indulgent servant, this manager, he says, if it's this way. But this manager is in the midst of his decadence when the master returns. I mean, he's surprised by the master coming home. There's no opportunity for repentance and restoration. Clearly, this indulgent servant thought, well, there'll be time. <laughs> He'll never catch me. I'll, I'll make it right before it's all over. But the master returns at a moment that he did not expect. Does this remember, you know, remind you of anything that we studied recently? Remember, remember the parable of the rich, greedy man who's going to tear down his barns and build bigger ones? And he says, now you've got it made. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God on that very night comes to him and says, you fool, you stupid fool. Your soul will be demanded of you right now. And that's the kind of picture. Whether, you know, Jesus comes again for the second coming or we just get hit by a bus, we don't know at the moment where we're going to be held accountable. And this is the kind of seriousness that, that Jesus is laying out there. He said, I've given you time. I've given you responsibilities. I've given you everything that you need. Your father knows that you need them. Seek his kingdom. All this will be added unto you. But make no mistake. I am coming. Your soul, your time, everything, it belongs to me. And you will be accountable. And particularly, I think, if you're a leader, he fully expects that you'll be faithful to administering that duty. You have to remember something. The Bible presents the church, you guys, as the bride of Christ, his fiance. And there's going to be this great wedding and to be put in, in responsibility to be a management over the servants of the master's house is synonymous to, I want you to take care of my fiance and the kids. All right. However you want to do that. But when he comes back and finds that you've abused his bride, subjected his children to torment, there's going to be hell to pay. Let me tell you something. This keeps me up at night, and it should should keep all of us up who have any leadership role within the body of Christ. Jesus speaks of two other groups of people who will be held accountable. He says, there are those servants who know the master's will but fail to get ready and serve as they have been instructed and they will be punished with many blows. This group are not cast out with the unbelievers, but there's accountability. And then there's those who did things deserving punishment, but they didn't know the master's will and their punishment will be less. I don't have time to unpack all of those. I, I, I think... It's a redundant message, but there are different degrees. But the message is, look, what you do in this life, it actually does matter. It matters a great deal to our master. He did not simply die and suffer the cross in order for us to one day go to heaven. He died and suffered the cross that we would come into his family and that we would serve his kingdom. What happens in the hours that you have left in this life matter an awful lot to the Lord, particularly for those of you who have been delivered from the tyrant and now serve in his house. This is accountability and we all need it. Jesus concludes this with these words. He says, from everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. 
you know, I look around in our church and I, I know so many of you, and I just think, golly, Pete, you know, we have been entrusted with much. So many of us have been entrusted with so much. And it's not just money. It's, it's a deep faith. It's a testimony. It's families. It's, it's all of this, that, this time that we have. It would be so easy for us to think, well, I kind of earned that. I've worked hard. I, I've earned this and I've earned that and I'm kind of all that. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. You work for me. What you have has been entrusted to you. What you have has been given to you. But with that comes an expectation. It, it, there's much that's expected from you. Now, let me tell you something. I don't think that Jesus said any of this to scare us into submission. But he is helping us to understand how it works. This is how it looks. And you have to remember, Jesus died to set prisoners free. So within the biblical worldview, here are your choices if you leave here today. I mean, you can say, I don't believe any of that, whatever. According to the biblical worldview, there's only two places where you can land. You're either a slave to the tyrant who does not love you, who will not forgive you, who lies to you night and day, or you have been delivered from that and brought into the family of God and you serve the master and you serve in his house, his kingdom. Those are the only two legitimate places that you can land within a biblical worldview. So you have to find yourself within the narrative and say, now where am I? If, if you're a subject to the tyrant and you serve a master that does not love you and will not forgive you, it could be any number of things, right? The invitation is to confess your sin, and call upon the name of Jesus and be rescued by the general who bled for you that you might be delivered out of tyranny, brought into the family of God, be treated like a son and daughter, that you have a role to play for the rest of your life in the kingdom. If you're already in the house, you're already a member of the body of Christ, the, the family of God, you're a subject of the kingdom, then here's the word of the Lord for you today. Be ready, all the time. There's no such thing as going on break. There's no such thing as quitting time. All the time, 24 seven, you belong to him. He's gonna use your life as he sees fit for his purpose. Keep your lamps lit. And when you're done, you get to go home. And if he comes and he finds you serving and waiting, then he will serve you. That's an amazing picture. That is our invitation. Let's pray. Lord, this is uh, heavy stuff. And it's hard for us to understand sometimes how this applies directly into our circumstances, but it really does come down to this. Either we belong to you or we serve another. And if we belong to you, you've made it absolutely clear of what you expect. To be truthful, to be generous, to be not afraid, and to be vigilant in a perpetual state of readiness, understanding who we are and who we serve, and not to do so out of mechanical duty or coercion or some sense of we get your stuff. <laughs> but that because you first loved us. Lord, we, we're gonna fail miserably at this if we don't have the power of your Holy Spirit living in us. We need your very presence taking up residence within us. So I pray today for any soul who might see his sin, understand that he serves a tyrant and desires to be liberated and brought into your camp, be brought into your kingdom. That that believer now would just call upon your name and receive the power of the Holy Spirit that empowers us to will and to do what is right and good, to fulfill our destiny, to serve our role in your kingdom. Lord, this is our prayer as your church. In Jesus' name, amen.